Welcome! This is the eighth in our series of videos about understanding space weather. This one is going to be about the Maunda Minimum. Well, what is the Maunda Minimum? Well, it's a period from 1640 to 1710 when the sun apparently produced very few sunspots. You can see it here marked in red on this curve. The problem is that during that period there were very few sunspot observations and what ones there were were taken with crude and low resolution optics so many of the smaller sunspot groups would have been missed. You can see the effect of that between the older observations marked in red and the newer uh, method of measuring sunspot number marked with this black curve and the old uh, red uh, dots are about a factor of three or four lower than the current method of measuring sunspots. So that could say that all of these uh, dots are uh, significantly higher than is shown here. People often talk about a second um, grand minimum, the so-called Dalton minimum, when we had two relatively low sunspot cycles, one after the other. There are other solar minima as well. We have the Spora minimum, the Wolf minimum and the Oort minimum also identified. Now these have been discovered using the isotopes of various elements and this red curve here shows the uh, isotope carbon-14. There's another one that is often used which is beryllium-10 and that's shown here with the blue curve. And at the bottom in the red curve I have the sunspot number. So let's mark on here where the Maunder minimum was, that's that shaded area. Now you can immediately see a number of different things. But well, first of all these three different quantities are not very well correlated. If you look at the beryllium-10, yes, there is a very major dip in the beryllium-10 flux around about 1700, but the, for the previous 50 years of the Maunder minimum, the concentration looked fairly uh, uniform. Uh, if you go to the uh, carbon-14, that's just doing a steady decline and doesn't look like either of the other curves. If you go back to the spora minimum, the beryllium-10 has a major peak right in the middle of it, and there is no sign in the carbon-14 of that peak. So we have problems that the different isotopes, if considered independently, are giving us different measures of something, none of which is what we particularly want. Now we've had five of these minima in the last thousand years, if you count the Dalton minimum, and so that's an average of about 200 years between each one. But if you look closely, they're not uniformly spaced. So any attempt to say there's 400 or 200 or 300 year periods in this is doomed to failure because they just simply aren't evenly spaced. The other problem that's here, if you look at the uh, sunspot number curve at the bottom, is the sudden onset of the Maunder minimum. Uh, we had a fairly healthy solar maximum just before the Maunder minimum, and also the sudden ending of the Maunder minimum when we started getting build up of sunspots relatively rapidly. That's a problem for the solar dynamo theory, as we will see in a minute. We can go even further back in time and look at uh, the uh, previous uh, solar minima going using the carbon-14 as a proxy for sunspot number and you'll see there's a fairly major number of them over the last uh, 12,000 years but again you can see that the spacing between them is not at all uniform. The, the one I've indicated here on the right is about 2,000 years apart between the solar uh, grand minima and then there's two here just 100 years apart. So this makes little or no sense whatsoever again if you're trying to find periodicities in this or claim that we're due for one because there was one 400 years ago. You may recall I went over the solar dynamo theory in one of my previous videos. This is where you start with a simple north-south solar uh, field at solar minimum and differential rotation of the Sun winds up that magnetic field making it stronger, uh, eventually causing the field to kink and also become uh, buoyant and float to the surface and, be and is visible as sunspots. Those surface features start to cancel the trailing parts with the uh, polar regions and the leading parts with each other across the equator. And you end up, when all this cancellation is completed, with the uh, very simple north-south polar field again uh, but now reversed and then again the course the process repeats itself reversing back again so you have the 11 year solar cycle and the 22 year magnetic cycle. Now the problem with 
a Maunda minimum is how do you get rid of this flux so you don't get a solar cycle. The Sun is still differentially rotating, that can't stop. So you've got to somehow get have no magnetic field there and that's very difficult to do if you believe this model. But equally, once you've got rid of all that magnetic field so there are no sunspots coming, there's no reversal and there's no buildup of magnetic flux, so you can't get out of it again. You'd end up with a, effectively a magnetically dead star. All of this has to be yet explained. Often when talking about the Maunder Minimum, people start linking it to the Little Ice Age. Well, that's not very uh, good science because the Maunder Minimum, as I say, went from 1640 to 1710, whereas the Little Ice Age started in 1350 and went to 1850. So it started 300 years before the Maunder Minimum and carried on at least 150 years after the Maunder Minimum. So if it's cause and effect, you would all, could only argue that the Little Ice Age caused the Maunder Minimum, which of course is very silly. You can, however, you can ask the question that did the Maunder Minimum exacerbate the uh, Little Ice Age, i.e. by lowering temperatures, and if so, by how much? How much does the total solar radiance change through a solar cycle? Well, let's first take a look at sunspots. Sunspots go from whatever maximum value there is during the solar cycle down to zero, and so that's 100% modulation throughout a cycle. So how does this compare with total solar irradiance? Well here is a plot of total solar irradiance, so let's put some maximum and minimum bars on there, and if you do that you find that it only varies by 0.1% compared with the 100% that sunspot numbers do. So the amount of modulation for a uh, the total solar radiance during a solar uh, cycle is very very small indeed. Now the minimum value of the total solar radiance is equivalent to that at solar minimum. So that's the sort of level we would be dealing with if we went into a prolonged solar minimum. But the question is, is that modulation is not very significant because here I've plotted the same total solar radiance curve as you saw before but now I've plotted it full scale and as you can see it's basically a straight line. Let's see if we can work out how much a 0.1% change in total solar radiance can affect global temperatures. And there's a very simple way of doing that approximately. Let's take a city with the sun overhead at the summer solstice. Uh, this would be uh, with the sun on the Tropic of Cancer and one such city is Havana, Cuba. In the winter the sun is going to be 47 degrees lower in the sky. So you can work out that the because of the change in angle that there will be a 22% drop in insulation in Havana. All we then need to do is to look up the difference in temperature between the summer and winter uh, time in Cuba. And that difference is about 4 degrees centigrade. So, so then all you have to do is multiply 4 degrees centigrade by 0.1 and divide it by 22. That will give you a, a change due to 0.1% change in total solar radiance. And if you do that, you find that that's equivalent to 0.02 degrees centigrade. Now you can do this for any city. You look up the, the latitude of your city, work out the altitude of the sun at the summer solstice and the winter solstice, uh, and see what the difference in your average summer temperature and winter temperature is, and you'll get basically the same result no matter where you look this up. Many are claiming we don't need to worry about anthropogenic global warming because if there's a grand solar minimum on the way, it's going to cool global temperatures sufficiently such that it will counteract the effects of global warming. Well, this was a calculation done by uh, a couple of scientists in 2010 showing the difference between uh, the current solar levels and those in a grand solar minimum. What, uh, and what would happen to the global temperatures. And you can see the change is absolutely minimal and it's consistent with the 0 0.02 degrees centigrade that I pointed out earlier. Well, let's draw some conclusions from what we've heard. The Maunder Minimum may or may not be real, although it seems likely that it is because there seems to be previous examples of it. It's probably just not very well understood by us as yet. If so, it poses some very basic problems for the solar dynamo model, which we have yet to solve. It does not seem to be linked to the Little Ice Age, and even if we went into a prolonged solar minimum, the Earth's temperature would not drop significantly.
and therefore it is no reprieve from global warming. Next time we're going to talk about plasma. <laughs>